Joel. Uh, okay, we, we're 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 on air right now. So, <laughs> okay, so hello everybody, and welcome back to the Latin American webinars on physics. Uh, my name is Joel Jones from the PUCP in Peru, and I'll be your your host today. Uh, today we're having our fourth colloquium uh, with a very relevant topic for these days. It's the cost benefit analysis of large research infrastructures, in, in particular the, the LHC. Uh, the colloquium is being given by Stefano Forte, uh, who is a professor at the physics department at the Università di Milano in, in Italy. Uh, so, so Stefano doesn't really require an, an introduction. He's a very well known in the particle physics community. Uh, just to give you an idea to those that do not know him, uh, he's the author of more than 100 published papers and has got an average of 97 citations pa per paper. So, so well known, <laughs> right? But still, I'll, I'll give it a try and introduce him to, to all of you, okay? So, so uh, Stefano carried out his PhD at, uh, at MIT, which was followed by postdocs at Saclay and CERN. Uh, he's been part of the INFN in, in Turin and, uh, and Rome, and in 2003 was named full professor at the University of, of Milan. Uh, in addition, he's been a visiting scholar in, in fancy places like the Ecole Polytechnique, the Niels Bohr Institute, Edinburgh University, the Université Pierre and Marie Curie, and also in the uh, University of Barcelona. And he's currently the recipient of an ERC advance grant, uh, which started in 2018. Okay, so um, okay, so before we begin, let me remind everybody uh, that you can ask questions and comments via the YouTube uh, live chat system. And this question will be passed on to Stefano at the end of, of his talk. So for some reason, my video has collapsed, but okay, that shouldn't be a problem because I'll send you up to give, uh, give you all Stefano. So we're all yours. Okay, so so thanks, Joel. I'm all, almost embarrassed by, by this introduction. Uh, so this is also the first time in, in my life that I give a, a web seminar, so I hope I can do this right. So let me share my screen now. Uh, right. And then let me get my slides on. Right, okay, so um, like Joel said, I'm going to uh, talk about a, a topic which is uh, somewhat unusual uh, for everybody and, and also for me since I'm a high energy physicist, uh, like I guess the majority of the people who are attending the seminar, but I'm going to talk about a topic which is interdisciplinary between science, uh, social sciences and economics and it's actually the uh, uh, topic of some, some work I did in collaboration with some colleagues from the economics department and from, uh, here in Milan and, uh, and the consultancy and there is now a project which is partly financed by CERN to keep uh, uh, doing this work. So you can see that it's uh, it's unusual, uh, it's also unusual for me because I'm, uh, uh, since uh, it's not a physics topic but inter interdisciplinary topic and the colloquium, instead of using LaTeX as I always do for slides, I'm using PowerPoint lookalike from, from Linux. Okay, so uh, like like Joel said, the main topic of, of my talk is uh, cost-benefit analysis. So I guess I should start by explaining what, what cost-benefit analysis is. Uh, that's something I learned myself when I started doing this work. Uh, cost-benefit analysis was invented by a, an engineer, actually, a French engineer uh, by the name of Jules Dupuis from Ecole Polytechnique, who uh, in the uh, beginning, well, half of the 19th century as uh, uh, France was becoming slowly an industrial nation and it also was uh, becoming a country where the government would invest in, in public goods. He asked the question, what's the value of a bridge if uh, no toll is levied on the bridge? I mean, up to that point, uh, infrastructures like bridges were done by some private guy who actually had people paying. Uh, now, if the government, and then you know how, how much it's worth, it's worth the amount of money you, you, you can make by exactly a toll on people who go on the bridge and but then he, he asked okay can we establish a scientific framework the guy was an engineer I mean a couple of technique is the is the alma mater of Poincaré I mean you know it's an institution which is for engineers but had a solid ma 
mathematical uh, background. And so he wanted to pose in a quantitative scientific way this question. Now, the question, if you think about it, is, is a difficult one for two classes of reasons. I mean, one reason is purely um, uh, you know, quantitative and has to do with the fact that the value of a bridge uh, does not just depend on how many people will go over it, but on many factors. Uh, uh, what I'm showing here is a picture of the bridge in Mostar. This is a bridge which was uh, destroyed in the civil war in Bosnia in the late 90s and then it was reconstructed based on a fund, international fundraiser. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a symbol of the union of a um, town which had a Muslim community and a Christian community and uh, that was the reason of the civil war. So uh, at, at present uh, on this bridge there is a yearly uh, a diving contest. So you know you could think what's the touristic value of people going to see the bridge or to see the diving context and that of course should also be counted in the benefits. Uh, but then of course you can also say yeah, sure uh, there are benefits that you can quantify, like, uh, you know, how many people will check in the hotels of this town to see the bridge, but there are others uh, that you cannot quantify, like how much is the symbolic value of having a bridge which is the symbol of peace between two different communities, uh, and to which extent can we make that quantitative and can we keep the things separate. Uh, now, uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis, so you understand it's a... Uh, 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 relatively complicated subject, but it's also well-established one. And in particular, in, in Europe, uh, there is a, an institution which is called uh, uh, the European Investment Bank, which is not really a bank. I mean, it's called bank, but it's really an institution which gives loans to European governments. So, for example, if you are, say, the government of uh, uh, the Czech Republic and you want to build a bridge, then you may want to ask a loan at a reduced rate from these guys. And before doing, uh, before, you know, deciding whether they will give you the loan, they will make a cost-benefit analysis and they do this based on a manual which has uh, editions where there is a well-defined protocol. And, you know, of course, at the end of the day, you may decide to give the loan based on political considerations, but still you want to know how much the thing costs. And uh, it turns out that the coordinator of the academic panel who established the methodology which is used in the last editions of this manual is a colleague from mine, Massimo Florio from, from the economics department of my university. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, he thought uh, that it might be interesting to uh, develop and apply uh, this, this set of methodologies to science. Now, the reason why this is interesting is that uh, the way the value of science is assessed is usually uh, not very accurate. So, for example, uh, uh, the Battelle Institute, which is a consultancy, so, you know, supposed to be professional economists who are supposed to know uh, what they do. Uh, a few years ago, they claimed that the Human Genome Project had a return of a factor 140, meaning if you put $1, you'd get $140 back after 10 years or something, which, you know, just think about it, doesn't make any sense. Uh, Washington Post would call it a three Pinocchios uh, uh, kind of uh, claim. I guess only Donald Trump manages to get more Pinocchios than that. Um, uh, you know, if, if that was the case, why would people invest in stocks and not in, in, in uh, uh, the uh, Human Genome Project? Uh, on the other hand, you know, these things may, this kind of uh, exaggerated claims may work well, or they may backfire. Uh, in our field of high energy physics, we know of a case, the LHC, which was actually saved by the fact uh, that in 2002, when CERN had a, a severe economic crisis, uh, the European Investment Bank, which I mentioned already, decided to uh, make a loan of 300 million euro to CERN. They didn't do the CBA because uh, the uh, protocol didn't exist, but, you know, based on the CERN prestige, they decided to do it. Had they not done this, uh, probably the LHC would have gone down the same fate as the SSC, which, uh, as the older among those who are listening surely remember, uh, almost killed high energy uh, physics in, in the United States. And, you know, I'm, I belong to the generation of those who were postdocs when the SSC was closed. And in fact, uh, of all my contemporaries at MIT, I'm essentially the only one who was left in, in physics because I went back to Europe rather than staying in the United States. So 
this this work I'm gonna talk about uh, started when the European Investment Bank, actually, uh, uh, or rather, the, the uh, Research Institute of the European Investment Bank, made a call for grants, asking for people to make a proposal to develop a, a framework for doing. Uh, cost-benefit analysis for research in infrastructure, and uh, my colleague from economics said, okay, why don't we do a proposal? Uh, we did it, we got the grant, and uh, we put together a, th a team which worked uh, for three years, 2013, 2015. You can see here it had people, uh, well, the head of the team was my economist colleague, and then it had a steering committee including myself uh, and uh, uh, him and the uh, responsible of a consultancy here in Milan and a number of people both from science and from statistics and, and from economics. Uh, you can see in the scientific committee uh, James Sterling who's very well known uh, in the uh, high energy community and uh, at the end of this project we produced two things. We produced a model so that from now on there is something which in principle could be applied to do a cost-benefit analysis for research infrastructures uh, not just CERN, but whatever, not just physics, uh, also biology, also the Human Genome Project, or a, uh, you know, a, a, a telescope, or whatever. And we also produced a case study, which was published, where we applied our model to the LHC. Um, we applied it to the LHC, including some part of the model going into the past and some part going into the future. <coughs> the, the result was published in 2016, as I said, and the analysis started with the beginning of the LHC and stretched all the way to 2025. Now, um, so let me get let me get to uh, so did, now I, you know so far I described how I got to do this and, and what are the motivations. So let, let, now let me try to get to the content of of doing cost benefit analysis for research. So wh why is it that sometimes there are surreal claims like the ones uh, uh, concerning the human genome project. Well, that's mostly because people uh, fall into the fallacy, which I call the fallacy of the hole in the ground. The idea is you pay someone to dig a hole in the ground and then to fill it again, and since you're spending money, you say, well, that's a benefit because <coughs> I invested something in research. Now, <coughs> that's obviously silly, and the reason to see that is silly <clears throat> I'm very sorry, <clears throat> is to make a proper job. And a proper job means that actually you have to take, when, when computing costs and benefits, you have to take the difference between how much money you spent and how much money you get back. So if you just dig a hole and uh, you're paying something, there is full balance between how much you pay, how much it costs, and how much you get. And as a matter of fact, it, the balance is usually negative because then you know you have entropy, you have someone falling into the hole. So the guiding principle of any well done analysis is that you have to determine uh, the gain. So you have to determine the difference between what you spend and what you get. And this difference has to be done with respect to a counterfactual, meaning, say, if I want when I'm determine what's the benefit of building a telescope, well, you have to say, okay, what, what, what is the counterfactual? What if I did not build a telescope? I would still, for example, pay the salary of a bunch of people. So it's only uh, a difference that you have to account for. And that's, that's why the thing is not obvious. So the model which was, uh, was developed by essentially my economics colleagues is based on calculating what is called the net present value. Uh, a net present value is, uh, is a concept which is familiar to economists, but, but not to me, that, uh, 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 so I assume also not to you, so let me explain. So the idea is if, if I give you $1,000 now, uh, the present value is $1,000. But if I tell you I'll give you $1,000 in 10 years, the net present value of $1,000 in 10 years is less than $1,000 because you are getting them in 10 years, not now. And there is uh, something which is called the discount rate, which basically allows you to uh, evolve back the value of something that happens in the future to what would be its present value, namely the value of it happening now. And this means that in order to determine the net present value of, of something, uh, so say uh, 
accelerator like the LHC, you have to determine a bunch of benefits, B, happening at time T, and a bunch of costs also happening at time T, and then you sum over all discrete times <coughs> at which these benefits and costs occur, and you evolve back to the present, and, and the discount rate is something which you can, can you know, it's estimated by governments and, and uh, government agencies. And then you have some things which uh, I'm going to explain, which are called uh, non-use benefits, meaning that they are benefits which happen at all times. They don't happen at a given time, and, and you also have to account for those. So, so what we did was to classify the benefits, uh, the use benefits, which happen at times, and the non-use benefits, which are uh, you know, atemporal, uh, and then we applied the thing to the LHC. So, um, let me just summarize what we found for the LHC and then let me get explicit and explain what are the various benefits. So in the case of the LHC, we made a study which stretched over 33 years from the beginning of the design of the LHC in 1993, when people started spending, at CERN started spending money on the LHC, to the uh, predicted end of life of the LHC. After that, we now know will happen the high Lumi LHC, but that's a separate thing. We had to choose a counterfactual. The counterfactual was, you know, CERN keeps running, but with no LHC. Uh, and then we had to make some assumptions like the discount rate and uh, uh, so on. Uh, I, I, I can, you know, give you further technical details in the question session if you're interested. Um, let me just mention that costs are in principle a triviality in the sense that, you know, they are an accounting problem, but uh, they are a difficult accounting problem. So, for example, when you're estimating the cost of CERN, you have to keep into account the fact that there are many people working on experiments at CERN whose salary is not paid by CERN, but rather by their home institutions. And of course, they are not putting 100% of their time to CERN, but they are maybe also teaching a class in their home university. So, you, you know, uh, you have to make a, a, a sophisticated uh, piece of accounting, uh, which is to say that if you want to be quantitative rather than just, uh, uh, you know, talk about folklore, you have to be careful, uh, but it can be done. And now, now let me come to the benefits. So. Uh, we did this uh, for our case study, but we claim uh, that this is of general applicability. Namely, that there are four use benefits and two non-use benefits, one of which is zero. So four use benefits. Use benefits means that there is some user who gets the benefit. And, and I'm showing them here. So one use benefit is uh, papers that you published and the beneficiaries are scientists. The second use benefit is human capital formation. So students and postdocs, people who go to work at CERN and then move on either by staying at CERN or by going to industry or by going to education, whatever, but they get a benefit from their education. Uh, technological spillovers, so firms, for example, like the company that built magnets uh, for CERN, which you see in the picture, who get the benefit by uh, developing know-how, which they are then going to market, and therefore the whole society will benefit from the fact that there is uh, some company which developed something uh, by going to CERN. And then cultural benefits, which are those uh, uh, from people who uh, come and visit, say, CERN, or go and look on social media, and so on. And then, and, and of course, uh, the, the users of the last cultural benefit are visitors and people who read the outreach material and so on. Now, non-use benefits. Non-use benefits are a bit harder to explain, but let me try and do this. So there are two. One is the value of future discoveries. This is called in economics, a quasi-option value. It's an option value because it's a future value. So it's like, you know, when you buy an option on selling uh, tobacco 10 years from now. Here, it's a value of making a discovery. Uh, but it's a quasi-option value because the discovery is not guaranteed. Now, of course, there is a sense in which this is the real value of uh, science. But uh, unfortunately, this is totally unpredictable. So if you want to be quantitative, you should set it to zero. I'll comment again on this by, at the end of my talk. But, but then to be conservative in a serious model, in a serious CBA, this is something you must set to zero because it's too uncertain. 
the other thing is the existence value or as it is called also sometimes the public good value uh, the public good value or the existence value is the value that you attribute to something uh, because of the sheer fact of existing so I'm showing a picture of a panda because most people in the world would say that if the panda become extinct then humanity will lose something now you know there's nothing for me to gain by pandas uh, living in China but still I would be willing to pay uh, to make a donation to some fund uh, in order to make sure that the panda does not go extinct and there are methods to estimate this for example using the techniques on environmental economics based on how much uh, you know people are willing to say pay in order for these things to happen and this is a non-use value because there is no use to the panda but still i'd like the panda to exist there is no use in some sense to having a research institution but uh, you know a research institution in that sense is like a, an opera house a library a museum it's something that you want to keep okay so for cern when we put everything together we discovered uh, I'm mentioning this because, again, it's not universal. Uh, it can be very different in many cases, but there are some qualitative features which are maybe common. So we discover that the uh, uh, costs and benefits uh, almost ban balance, but actually with, uh, with the uh, cost, which is for CERN 13 billion euro uh, in present 2016 value, which is when we published our uh, study. Uh, and instead, the benefits actually amounting to uh, uh, a difference of uh, uh, 11 billion euro more than the 13 you spent um, with a probability distribution. So if you want to do things properly, of course, you have to give probability to events the way this was done by running in Monte Carlo and saying, OK, we give a probability distribution for having students making so much money. And therefore, at the end of the day, you, you can estimate a, a, you know, a mean uh, uh, gain, a median gain, a standard deviation, a minimum, a maximum. Uh, so in our case, we estimated that the probability of losing money from CERN was less than 10 percent. And, and uh, like I said, I'm sorry, I said the wrong number previously. I mentioned 11 billion. That was, however, the maximum gain. Uh, uh, the average gain would be about 3 billion. So the idea is you invest 14 billion. Uh, and you get uh, 18 billion, so you, you, you get 4 billion out of that. Uh, that does not include, uh, of course, the values of discoveries. It does not include what is good, say, for us scientists, but it's something you can tell a politician. Look, if instead of giving that money to CERN, you had to train scientists and you had to develop firms and so on, you would have spent so much. Okay, uh, and what we discovered also was that, uh, the, as you may expect, the value of scientific publications is completely negligible, so I'm not going to talk about that any longer. And otherwise, uh, in about equal proportions, the benefit was in knowledge formation, so, you know, uh, uh, sorry, it was in human capital, so the uh, fact that you train people, in technological spillovers, and in putting together the cultural and existence value, which uh, are actually close related, closely related to each other. So, so the benefits is really almost equally distributed among these three things. So at this point, uh, I'm, I guess, two thirds of the way through, and I still didn't tell you how we estimated these benefits. So that might me spend my last uh, 10 minutes giving you an idea of how we actually um, managed to estimate that you can get benefits from these three major sources, human capital, technological spillovers, and cultural plus existence values. Uh, I will explain this to you by trying to answer two objections. So the first objection is, OK, you develop a model, you get some numbers, but how do you know the model is correct? And so what I'm going to show you is that after publishing this uh, three years ago, uh, me, but mostly my economics colleague, made a number of studies to try to do empirical analysis that give evidence that support the conclusion of the model. And then the second objection is, uh, this was applied to something that already exists. Can you do it for something that doesn't exist? Uh, as I mentioned, we got some grant from CERN and, and uh, my economics friends uh, mostly did it for the high Lumi LHC. And now there is some effort ongoing for the future circular collider. So let me come to the three main classes of benefits. So the first one is technological spillovers. 
And uh, this, uh, in turn, is subdivided into two subcategories. So one is, you know, a company builds something for CERN, a magnet, and in so doing, they gain know-how. So the whole society benefits from this because there is extra know-how from the society. And this you can estimate by using procurement data in a way which I'm going to explain a little more in a second. And the second is simply you develop something and make it uh, and you give it for free. So, for example, there is some software which was developed at CERN uh, and then given for free. And, of course, there are things like the World Wide Web, but we did not include that in the analysis because, you know, that's a one-off thing and you cannot count on that happening. So, let me explain the first thing. Procurement activity at CERN for procurement is huge. I mean, there are 4,000 suppliers from almost 50 countries, uh, tens of thousands of orders, billions of Swiss francs. The Swiss franc is uh, uh, more or less like one dollar, so or, which is more or less like one euro, so billions of dollars or euros. Uh, you can have a, a, a timeline of these, and then you can make a, an analysis, which uh, we did at the time based on a model, but we subsequently did based on actually analyzing the procurement data which was given to us by CERN, by the CERN procurement office, and there is some multivariate model, which is basically a system of cu coupled equations when you take uh, companies that work for CERN and you see uh, you have a bunch of variables. You like, uh, you know, how much they spend in R&D, how many patents they made, what's their productivity, how much money they make. Uh, uh, we had all these data and then you analyze the time flow of this, you solve for the model. And in the end, you can see, you, you do it both for companies that did work for CERN and for companies that did not for, work for CERN. And also you can classify companies that did work for CERN between high tech and non high tech. You know, the guy who supplied magnet, superconducting magnet, magnet to CERN and the guy who provided uh, uh, paving the roads at CERN or building the buildings. And, and you can see that there is a strong positive correlation. The firm who worked for CERN uh, has a, a much higher R&D investment, productivity, more patents, more revenues. Uh, but that only happens when it's a high-tech firm. So that's a quantitative evidence in favor of our model. And there are many more studies which I don't have time to discuss, which were done by my economist friends. I'm mentioning them in these slides. The slide will remain online so you can check out the um, literature. In particular, one of these studies is based on taking one piece of code, root, which is freely uh, available and, and trying to estimate how much uh, money society is gaining by having this piece of code freely available. Okay, so second uh, big class of benefits, human capital. Human capital means someone goes to CERN, they work at CERN, but they are a student, a postdoc, uh, uh, junior faculty, and then they move on and, and they gain something, the society gains something because they've been trained at CERN. Now, there are standard ways of estimating this. For example, there is a, uh, this website, which you see on the slide, called Payscale, where you can see how much more money you would make if you got your you know, your master's or a PhD at Harvard in comparison to, say, the University of North Dakota. So you can ca use the same sort of methodology to assess how much money uh, people are making because they went to CERN. And the difference, of course, is that, uh, you know, if you want to go to Harvard as an undergraduate, you have to spend a huge amount of money and get a loan for that. If you are going to CERN, uh, not only you don't spend money, often you even get paid for it. So that's an investment that society is putting and, uh, and for which it's getting a benefit. And again, we had a model, but this model was subsequently validated by a study, which you can see here in this slide. It's been published. It's been done by my colleagues who got the full set of data from uh, the CMS Experimental Collaboration, which is a huge uh, uh, collaboration, 4,000 people, and therefore you, uh, you, they have a database where they know where people went after uh, working for them. And then you can ask questions to their former bosses at CERN. You can ask questions to them. And, and you can actually establish uh, uh, what is the salary premium, how much more money you would make by having been a CERN postdoc as opposed by not having been a CERN postdoc. So that was a third, second class, and let me get to the third class, because uh, uh, my time is uh, approaching rapidly uh, to the end. The third class is cultural benefits. 
uh, how do you estimate cultural benefits? Well, that's 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 easy. I mean, you know, there are lots of people who go and visit, uh, uh, say, the NASA Goddard Space Center, which you see pictures here. There are fewer people who go and visit CERN, uh, but you can estimate how much uh, uh, money that's worth by just having, you know, if you went to Disneyland, uh, then you, you have to pay. If you go to CERN, you don't have to pay, and, and therefore that's that's a benefit. And indeed, you can classify these things. Uh, by looking at uh, uh, numbers of visitors, and this is now something which is recognized. Uh, it's been strongly recognized recently by CERN, who decided to where they decided to construct this new science gateway designed by Renzo Piano, a star architect, uh, uh, funded by external companies. Uh, like Chrysler, Fiat, uh, and uh, which, uh, you know, uh, is something which will attract people to CERN to learn about science and, and, and physics. Um, and uh, like I said, you can estimate that using techniques of uh, tourism. And then there is a famous uh, uh, public good value or existence value, which I mentioned before, which you can say, well, how do we estimate that? Well, people have tried to estimate this. For example, when the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened, there was an international uh, court that had to decide how much worth it was having killed whales in the ocean, and you use standard techniques. Now, the standard way of doing this is to use willingness to pay. And in order, so we had some estimate of this, and this has been recently validated uh, again by my colleagues who ran a very extensive survey to French taxpayers. So the idea, they've done it to French taxpayers because they wanted to limit it to one country to keep things under control, but they did it to a large database of people, uh, you know, using standard techniques. And, and basically the idea is you, you ask people how much would you be willing to pay uh, uh, to keep CERN alive, and you have to do it following some standardized gu guidelines. You have to tell people what CERN is about because, you know, most people never heard of CERN. Uh, uh, so, and you don't want to have a bias. So you want to take the man in the street, uh, you know, the cab driver, whoever, and, and explain to him, you know, we have this lab doing science and uh, uh, they discovered the Higgs boson and what's the Higgs boson and, and, and so on. You show them a short movie and then you ask them how much they uh, are willing to pay and, uh, uh, this was done in a fairly proper way uh, with a, a sample of, uh, you know, five samples of 2,200 people each. So, so it's a thousand people. And then you have a bidding procedure whereby in order not to bias them, you ask them, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what if I told you that you have to have a one euro tax increase because of CERN and so on. And, uh, you know, I skip the details again. Um, uh, I can give them to you if you're interested. I'm not an expert of this. And basically, the outcome of this was that if you do the most conservative estimate, so you do a bounded conditional average willingness to pay, bounded conditional average means that you, uh, for example, correct for the fact that someone who's richer is willing to pay more, uh, and you don't want to assume that people are rich, and, uh, and, and, and therefore you really have to give some uh, something that is sustainable and believable, and uh, uh, the average willingness to pay for French citizens was about four euro per year. What CERN costs to French citizens is less than three euro per year. So basically, we are saying that the willingness to pay of the French citizen is actually more, and therefore this is uh, you know is reasonably uh, to be counted as a benefit. Okay, so with this, uh, I'm getting to my conclusion. Like I said just to make sure that this cannot only be done for the past, but also for the future. Uh, it's been done for the High Lumi LHC. And, you know, High Lumi LHC was a piece of cake because it's similar to, to the LHC, same categories. It's just scaled on different times. Here, the counterfactual is, is easy. So uh, uh, you can see uh, here that the um, um, uh, counterfactual is, is the blue thing uh, in the bottom right, which means CERN without high Lumi LHC, and, uh, and actually the uh, posit 
positive thing is uh, is a pink thing and the conclusion is that there is a very low probability that uh, again the high lumi lhc will have a negative cost so with this uh, i'm coming to my conclusion uh, uh, which is uh, that uh, you know we claim that we put uh, the cost benefit analysis for fundamental research on a quantitative basis and we also claim that there is strong evidence uh, that there are benefits to society even when the utility of future discoveries is unknown and therefore we estimated it to zero and this comes from technological spillovers human capital and cultural benefits in almost equal proportion and uh, my colleague and friend Massimo Florio actually spent last year on sabbatical writing a book on this, which is about to be published by MIT Press. So uh, here is the data of the book if you're interested in asking, say, your library to buy a copy. And then, uh, uh, so with this, I'm coming to the end. And let me uh, conclude uh, asking the question, but is, is all this, uh, which I said, meaningful? I mean, you know, often, I've given this kind of talks before on, on, on this work, or you know, I've been describing this work uh, to physics colleagues, and often they say, "Yeah, but why do we care?" But this this is not this is not why we do science. I mean, what's this cost-benefit analysis good for? Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, there's a fellow who uh, uh, called uh, uh, who coined the term big science, uh, Alvin Weinberg. He's no relation to Steve Weinberg just the same name. He was the head of Oak Ridge Laboratory in the US in the 1950s. And, you know, when he coined the term big science in the paper, he said that particle accelerators are the cathedrals of the 20th century. So um, I'm, uh, uh, I'd like to make the point that doing a cost benefit analysis for uh, research infrastructure is like doing a cost benefit analysis of the cathedral. I mean, the people who built the cathedral, like Charter Cathedral, which you see in the picture, in the Middle Ages, uh, probably thought that they were building it to save souls, you know, you know to send people in paradise or something. Uh, yet, if you read any history book, you'll see that cathedrals had a very important economic role in, in medieval Europe, because cathedral cities were the center of uh, markets, and therefore, uh, around cathedral city, the economy uh, of Europe was basically rebuilt and that's where the Renaissance come from and 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 therefore uh, you know whatever the reason why the men of the Middle Ages were building their cathedrals uh, there are some benefits that we can estimate uh, now and, and and which remain so so the idea is the following uh, you know maybe we physicists uh, are doing science for reasons which are you know we think probably that we are cleverer than the men in the middle ages and and therefore we are really discovering uh the truth or uh some fundamental uh laws of nature and we think that there is a benefit for that but on the other hand of course we have a responsibility to society who's paying for us for our salaries and the research and and therefore uh by doing this kind of analysis we are telling them look i mean whatever uh we do whatever our motivations, even forgetting the possibility that we may discover, develop a World Wide Web or discover uh, teleportation or the time machine or goodness knows what, uh, still you can make a decent case that the money you're giving to, uh, to us uh, is something you get something back for. It's not just you know something you give us for free and that the society is getting this back in terms of education, in terms of technology, and also in terms of uh, culture and things that uh, the man in the street is reasonably willing to pay for. Thank you very much. Okay, super. Can, you, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Super. Um, so thank you very much for, for the for the webinar, it's been great. So let's have now uh, the, the questions. So let's start with the, with the listeners. Uh, I have a quick question, Stefano. Um, yeah. so, so normally, like, uh, well, for example, here in the States, uh, if you want to do a research, like for your group, you might apply to a grant, to a, let's say NSF, and then you get the money. Uh, but, but in South America, there are cases, and I'm speaking in particular about Colombia, 
where this is not like highly articulated like that. So in the sense that you want to do your research, uh, so you, what you do is you apply to your own home university for a sort of grant and then you get the money. But then sometimes it's very hard because the, the impact is not seen. And, uh, and in particular, if you do theoretical physics, it's, it's very hard. We do have a recommendation for those cases because, if, for instance, yeah, like the CERN develops like jobs, infrastructure, technology. But also behind that, there's this all also pure science and mathematics that was developed like way before. So, so I'm, I'm asking you like if, if you can have an advice for those cases where we are just doing like pure theoretical physics in, in a small scenarios and in particular, let's say in Colombia, where you apply to your home university to get funding. So sometimes it's quite hard to say, wait, why do you want to study geodesics of this particular space time or something like that? Where, of course, it's not going to be equally as nice as, as you show with the data because, because that's like very theoretical and behind but it will for sure, I'll, I'll believe, it will impact at some point. So what would you be the advice to get that funding and, and then just to show it like? Yeah, that, that, that's a very difficult question, of course. I guess what, what I would say is two things. I mean, first of all, uh, I think one can make reasonably the case that theoretical physics is part of a greater endeavor, uh, yeah. uh, which involves uh, national and international labs. Uh, you know, all uh, labs typically have a theory division or a bunch of yes. theories. And uh, often uh, for a, a country which has, which does not have much money to invest in science, uh, investing in theoretical physics can be a very good investment because, uh, uh, you know, there is not enough money uh, to, uh, say, to invest a so lab, but, but, but theoretical physics is cheap. And, <laughs> On the other hand, theoretical physics are needed. So, uh, in okay. fact, uh, you you may know in, in 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 Italy in Trieste there is an institution which is called the International Center for Theoretical Physics, yes, which was ICTP. Uh, actually ICTP, which was uh, established by uh, mostly by by the uh, late uh, Abdul Salam, the yes. Nobel laureate, who had this idea, which was precisely that uh, uh, countries uh, with uh, no much money should. Uh, um, mostly invest in theory because uh, because it's more cost effective the other thing of course of course you know then this is subject to the objection but but what do we care we want the uh, investment to get back to us i guess uh, it's uh, it can be reasonably argued that there is oh uh, are we still online yes yes yeah okay because i saw uh, an, something that says law physics uh, interrupted the presentation but that's maybe yeah. just YouTube channel or uh, okay, so I, I just keep going. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, right. Uh, so I, I was going to say that uh, s some of the benefits I described, I think, can be reasonably argued to uh, uh, be something which exists even at a smaller scale, specifically the human capital formation. I mean, okay. uh, yeah. you know, um, I'm not familiar with. Uh, 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 the way uh, uh, universities uh, uh, are uh, 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 their projects. organized or funded in, in, in Latin America, whether students pay tuition or not, I guess probably not, or to a, certainly to a lesser extent than the US. But I would say, you know, at the end of the day, uh, uh, university is a place which creates knowledge and society uh, is actually getting uh, uh, some benefit from this knowledge which uh, trickles over to society and and you could try to estimate using the same yes. sort of techniques. Okay. okay okay thank you very much Stefano and, and it was a very very nice colloquium thanks so i saw a question briefly appearing on my screen but i couldn't yes read because I, I'll, I I'll, I'll repeat it. this <laughs> and read simultaneously um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. so so this this question comes from uh, our uh, youtube channel uh, it um, it comes from Marvin Flores, uh, who who first is giving us some context. He is a postdoc in South Africa. Um, and he is from the Philippines, who do, and they don't have strong high energy physics group there. And he would like to know what advice can you give to third world countries who are planning to join huge collaborations like Atlas and CMS, considering the financial entry fee. 
So I uh, uh, look. I'm that, that, maybe I'm not the right person to ask that question in the sense that I'm a, a theoretical high energy. Uh, so that's that's more uh, a question really for <laughs> for. Um, experimental high energy physicist, I can tell you what I know, namely uh, that uh, um, both uh, CERN as a, as a lab and um, big experimental collaborations like ATLAS and CMS are uh, very aware of this problem. Uh, there are people at CERN, uh, I, I think one, one person is Albert de Rook, who was formerly the physics coordinator of CMS, and I think now he's in charge of this uh, for CERN, who are specifically in charge of trying to find ways to do this. And, uh, and uh, you know, I know, for example, that this guy is all the time traveling the world around, trying to manage to get deals whereby uh, people could get some, some training uh, from CERN in, 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 in various ways. So honestly, I cannot tell you what's the best way to do it, but I would tell you what, what I could tell you is to try and, and be as proactive uh, as possible in approaching uh, CERN. And th this is uh, actually true um, not only for uh, CERN, but I guess, you know, in general with uh, uh, other sort of science projects. And uh, since uh, uh, you are now working in South Africa, I can add the following, that one, one of my PhD students, or one of the PhD students funded on my ERC grant, who started one year ago, actually comes from, from South Africa. I, he's originally from Madagascar, but he got his PhD in South Africa. I know that he was a summer student at CERN. Uh, by being a summer student at CERN, he you know, got some very good training. Uh, 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 he got uh, some recognition in the community. Uh, he's now doing his PhD here. Uh, he's very good. I have no doubts uh, that uh, he would make a good career as a, as a postdoc. And uh, I'm not sure about his future after that. He's a young guy. He may want to go back to his home country, Madagascar, or, or, or to South Africa. Uh, you know, he's a decent person. So I would assume that he would want to do that. And, and you know, certainly, um, uh, uh, the, uh, by being proactive, and, you know, I, he, he found uh, the fellowship by looking on the web. Uh, I guess at the time when he went to uh, CERN as summer student, he discovered that there was this option, even though uh, he's not from a CERN member state. Um, so, so my advice would be to try and look as much as possible for opportunities. Uh, don't be shy. And uh, many international institutions and labs like CERN are very happy if you do this. Yeah, if I if I may add a, a comment on this based on our experience in in Peru, um, being part of uh, Atlas and CMS will also uh, boost a university's uh, status in the in the international rankings. Let's say. Uh, as when you're part of a of a collaboration, you have access to 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 you know you're part you're part of your, the 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 university is part of the experiment, right? So so it uh, it might uh, provide an incentive for a university to join. Of course, it's a it's a lot of work uh, for for the local scientists to to achieve the the, the standards that the experimental collaborations are asking for. But if you manage to do it, then you can easily persuade the university to, to, to pay the fee, given the large boost that it will get on, on the rankings. For sure. Yeah, I can add to this that I, uh, like I was mentioning to Joel, about a month ago I was at the LHCP conference, which is a major uh, conference involving LHC, which this year took place in, in, in Puebla, in Mexico. And uh, it was organized by faculty of the University of Puebla who are Atlas members, I guess, and it was obviously a big deal for them at the opening ceremony. Not only the president of the university was there, but also the minister of science uh, uh, and you know local authorities. So it, it was clearly a very significant boost uh, for for them having uh, six or seven hundred people from the CERN community from all over the world uh, go to Mexico. Maybe Mexico is a more uh, fortunate situation in terms of science funding. I have no idea, but. Uh, you know, it was clearly a lot of work for them, but I, uh, my impression was that they got something from 
Great. So are there any other questions from the listeners, from the current audience? I have a question. I mean, let's, let's say if I can say it because they are making words here. So if I have uh, enough science. So uh, first of all, Stefano, I like it a lot, your, your colloquium. And Thanks. I would like to ask you, for instance, because most of this stuff, most of the science and funding depends a lot of the politi politicians that are in the Congress and the government. So from all these activities that you were highlighted, like human resources or outreach, so on and so forth, which are the ones that, in your opinion, could help to increase this political willingness to, to increase the funding to science or to funding science? Because when in Latin America, most of the politicians, they are very, they don't like to fund, to give money to science because they think that, yeah, they don't know what is the potentiality of that. So if in your case of, for instance, in the case of Italy, or other European country, because also it's very hard to, to increase a little bit, to increase the budget for science in European countries. So yeah. I don't know your opinion about that. Well, I mean, you know, from uh, of, of course, I, uh, you know, I had a, I, I had been relatively lucky or fortunate in the sense that, you know, I interacted with, uh, for example, people at the uh, European Investment Bank who funded our uh, grant and uh, who are obviously people who, in some sense, already have a positive prejudice, uh, uh, and uh, through CERN we did interact with politicians. But then, you know, a politician who comes and visits CERN again, typically he has a, a positive attitude. I would say that the, uh, probably I, I think uh, the three benefits I described uh, uh, can all be uh, presented and. Uh, sold in some sense to politicians uh, uh, if presented in the light in the right way in the following sense uh, the human capital formation i guess is obvious and i already mentioned that answering to a previous question um, the technological spillovers uh, you know of course uh, i guess uh, a, a, a smaller country with a smaller research budget would probably not build the superconducting man magnets but i would imagine that if some company manages to participate in a tender even for uh, some relatively smaller part of CERN. I mean, as I, as I said, the procurement from CERN is huge. And, you know, if you manage to get a contract, I, I would imagine that could give a considerable boost, both in terms of R&D and, uh, and in terms of, of prestige. So, you know, in terms of national pride, in terms of being part of such a project, I think that's definitely something that a, a politician would understand. And that's also having a market value if you have some, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with um, uh, the kind of uh, industry that you have in your respective countries, but for example, I'm familiar with the fact that, you, you know, Italy is a country uh, uh, which is very divided in the sense that there is a developed north and a much poorer south, uh, yet I do know that even in the most depressed regions of the south of Italy, the ones which are still largely agricultural, occasionally you can find a small startup. So, for example, Sardinia, which is an island uh, off Italy, which is one of the poorest regions in Italy, for some reason, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, strongest uh, internet companies uh, in Italy came from Fr Sardinia. I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure why, but probably there was some local guy who had the idea. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, something similar must be the case in in a continent uh, like uh, uh, South America. Uh, you know that there, there must be local uh, groups that uh, you know. Uh, you can try and, and get in touch with. Uh, the other thing, the third thing is, uh, is again, you know, the uh, cultural benefit. Of course, if you put it in terms of cultural benefits or willing, willingness to pay, it's difficult to explain to a politician. On the other hand, if you put it in terms of national pride, it's much easier to explain. I mean, you know, after all, national pride is just a rebranding of the same thing. I mean, you know, uh, the, the thing which impresses us will be maybe different from the thing that impresses the politician. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember when, when, when uh, uh, I went to visit CERN with my economics uh, colleagues for the first time, we had a tour from the uh, then CMS spokesperson 
who, who's a good friend of mine. He's called uh, Tiziano Camparesi. Uh, and that was a time when actually the experiment was open because they were actually re, re, rebuilding. So you can actually see part of the CMS detector. And, 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 you know, when you go into the detector, there are all these parts of the detector which have little flags for the country where they would build. And, and I remember my economics colleague was very impressed by the fact that you could see uh, one piece of the detector where there was the American flag and the Iranian flag actually next to each other because there was some piece of detector was built from a small experimental group from Iran. So, you know, I can imagine that. So I'm not sure whether having a piece next to the US flag would be good propaganda in Iran. But, uh, but but you see what I mean. I mean, you know, you can say, look, I mean, we are part of uh, one of the world's greatest projects, and, and I guess that that is something which, which a politician will understand. Okay. Let's see anybody, any, oh, yeah, go ahead, Roberto. No, I, that, that, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. That is it, is it. Any, any other questions? Let's see. No questions on the YouTube channel. Um, so I, I had a, a question regarding um, the development of, of local communities around, like at CERN, you have uh, San Genie de Puli, which probably without CERN, you know, would have less than, I don't know, 500 people living there. And now it's like, boom, you know, larger. So 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 how, how does that kind of development enter this sort of analysis? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it's, it's a funny thing because uh, uh, I still remember that at some point there was uh, 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 some data uh, on the economic impact uh, of CERN that we were trying to acquire and we realized that the people at CERN would not want to give it to us because if they gave it to us, it would transpire from those data that, like you said, that the local um, region had benefited a lot from the presence of CERN, but then they did not want uh, people to know that because uh, if that was known, other member states would say, but then we want a rebate of our uh, contribution to CERN because France is actually getting more benefits than others. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, so in the end, uh, partly because of this, uh, this uh, benefit was was uh, not really included. Uh, so, you know, uh, it is uh, it is really debatable whether such a benefit should be considered or not. Uh, partly because uh, this is a bit uh, hole in the ground story. In other words, it's true, of course, that if you put money in you know, having a lab somewhere, then the local community will get a, a boost from that. But then you can say, yeah, sure, but is, is this really a net benefit? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm paying a salary to someone. Uh, this person is buying bread at the local supermarket. And, uh, you know, if he was elsewhere, he would spend the money elsewhere. And so the society as a whole is not obviously having a benefit. And, uh, and therefore, uh, after lengthy discussions, we concluded that uh, this should not be really counted as, as a net benefit because uh, a net benefit is something such that uh, the society as a whole is gaining something at, from having done this as, comparing, as compared to not having done it. And, and, and therefore, this you know, would not really be it. Uh, of course, uh, the... Uh, should be careful that some of this is included in the tourism value. Uh, that is a true value, of course. I mean, because, you know, if people go and spend money on hotels, say, in, in, in Geneva or in the surrounding of CERN, that is counted as a benefit, but it's not counted as a benefit because it means that the hotel owner makes money because, you know, after all, if the person did not go to CERN, maybe he would go to Ibiza or, or to, you know, to a, to a sea resort or something. It's counted as a benefit because it shows that that person is willing to put money in something which is part of his education and therefore he's, uh, you know, paying, he's uh, manifesting his willing, it's as if he was paying CERN. So, so the hotel is a proxy for the money that that person is, is putting in the whole project. If there was no CERN, he would not. So it's, it's like the ticket to Disneyland sometimes. 
Right, right, exactly. That's that's what I was thinking, right? If if you if you build a, a huge amusement park, then the the community around will also benefit. But that's but that's but it's, not a, that's not a benefit. On the other hand, the ticket on the amusement park is a benefit, obviously, to the owner of the amusement park. And sure. Yeah. Right, right, right. I don't know any other any other question. Let's check the last time for the last time the YouTube channel. No. No more questions. Uh, anybody else in the audience? Oh, yeah, Roberto. Yeah, in the, in the case of, because, yeah, let's say that mm, the funding is more or less uh, sure when when a government or the agreement. But in the case when there are there were economical crises, how CERN has to deal with that or future projects? Because uh, a lot of this money is kind of promised money, but it's not like hard the backup money that the government has to put. So how this affects the economical crisis, the funding of all the future projects in CERN? Yeah, well, again, you know, this is a difficult question and it's maybe a question that you should ask to uh, some, you know, someone who's part of the CERN uh, director or management. But I, I can tell you what I know, namely that CERN in many cases had to uh, uh, somehow uh, you know, negotiate a course through rough seas. Uh, so, for example, I, I, I mentioned this uh, uh, cost overrun. So, when there was so this economic crisis, which I mentioned, was actually internal to CERN. What happened was that in in 2001, uh, it was realized that actually mostly the construction of the LHC was was uh, overrunning in costs, and uh, it uh, there was a concrete danger. <laughs> that some, some member states would want to pull the plug and somehow uh, the CERN management managed to take countermeasures, one of which was basically that the then director general, who was Luciano Maiani, was uh, basically incapacitated. I mean, they put, you know, they he basically established some, some other board that would uh, check on his spending and, and uh, then they managed to get this uh, loan from the European Investment Bank. They managed to reschedule. So the, the LHC was originally due to start operation, I think, in 2008. And uh, by delaying it, actually, they managed to, well, of course, uh, you know, spend less money per year, which, of course, in the end, they spent more money, but per year, they spent less money because, uh, you know, they just said instead of building it in, in five years, we build it in. 10 years and so we build it on a, on, on a lower budget so so the, uh, the, the, they somehow managed to survive but 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 this is diff difficult I mean I um, read recently uh, a book uh, uh, about the demise of the superconducting super collider and uh, uh, which is a very good book uh, it's called tunnel visions uh, uh, and uh, it's written by an American historian of science by the name of Ray Ordon I think, uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the reason of the demise of the SSC was really a combination. So, of course, it has a cost of a run, but the LAC also had a cost of a run. But then somehow uh, uh, the SSC did not have a, uh, it, it was a, a, a project, uh, a greenfield project. They were going to build a new lab uh, in a new site, so it did not have a strong community. CERN has this uh, strong community behind it. So it has, uh, you know, there is a kind of uh, 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 a generation of CERN bureaucrats which have been trained for 50 years now because CERN was born in the late 1950s <coughs> who know how to deal with the situations and manage to uh, keep the whole act together while there it was a you know, bunch of people who probably do not did not know each other and there was a head of the lab who did not talk very well to the politicians and, <coughs> and who did not talk very well to what uh, in this book is called the military industrial complex in the US so somehow uh, it was much of a political problem rather than a so you know in in that sense uh, 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 Big labs like CERN or Fermilab, even national labs like we have Frascati in Italy or DAISY in Germany, often um, they are more than just a, 
research tradition. I mean, they, you know, they, they may have know-how, say, in building particle accelerators, but I think they have also know-how in dealing with politicians and, and making a case for science. And, you know, there are people who have been there, who have been lab directors, and, and you know, they started as postdocs working with someone who was a lab director before them. And, and so at the end of the day, I think for us uh, scientists having these... Uh, labs or these communities, even uh, theory, theoretical physics centers, is really a capital, not just in terms of science, but also in terms of uh, politics. And, uh, you know, often I, uh, I, I have the feeling that some people underestimate this. I mean, you know, you think, well, the guy went to politics, uh, he's no longer a scientist, you treat him with contempt. Well, you know, uh, I think they, some, some, many of these people uh, should be treated with respect. I, I mentioned earlier James Sterling, who is a uh, you know person who did important things in, in QCD, uh, uh, but then he established the ITPP in Durham in the UK, which is now one of the biggest centers for particle physics in Europe, and then he became the provost, which is basically the rector, the president of Imperial College, and uh, uh, you know uh, he was a great scientist. I knew him personally. Uh, but uh, he obviously played a big role uh, in in promoting science in Europe, and uh, and uh, so I think people who make that choice should be respected, and labs and, and groups that do this uh, uh, should uh, stay in this tradition alive. Okay, fantastic. Uh, any other any other questions from the audience? We're close to to the end of our time. But we might have one quick question. Okay, I think I think we're done. Okay, great. So so thank you so much, Stefan. It's been a, a great colloquium. Uh, thank you, thank you. I'm pretty sure that all the viewers uh, in, in enjoyed it uh, very much. Uh, so uh, now the 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 webinars go on a on a break, a, a winter break here, a summer break. In the Northern Hemisphere, and we start again in September, isn't it? So the 11th of September, where I'm, I'm getting a birthday gift, and starting the, <laughs> the, 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 the webinars on that day. Okay, great. So, um, okay, thank you very much, and see you everybody in September. Okay.